very nice to meet everyone. Um, there's a few faces I, of people I know and been working with over the last few months. Um, so nice to see everyone again. Um, I've been asked to um, present about the work which uh, the network called the um, Gentoris, the ERN for genetic tumor risk syndromes, where NF1, NF2, and schwannomatosis is included in the scope of the network. So the network was uh, had prioritized the development of an NF1 guideline. So I've been asked to present about that today. Um, we started at the beginning of the year by uh, prioritizing the development of guideline for NF1. And there was some discussion about where that guideline would be, uh, what the scope of the guideline should be. Um, as you all know, NF1, it's, there's a huge range of symptomology and presentation. Um, and uh, there was a, a consensus from the uh, research community that, um, that the, the should, we should focus on a tumour management guideline. Um, now, there's lots of different types of tumours uh, which uh, can affect someone with NF1. So we agreed on a guideline a scope, which was around the surveillance, follow-up and management of tumours in people with NF1 um, for all individuals, children and adults. Um, what, uh, what was the screening? What should be the screening for the detection of tumours? Uh, what should be done? When should it be done and how often? Um, we also wanted to look at what type of imaging was needed for screening and surveillance. Um, we also wanted to look at uh, when a tumour was diagnosed, um, is there an indication for surveillance different than for, for someone with NF1? Um, and we also looked at uh, when a tumour was diagnosed, if there was a different type of treatment for someone with NF1 because of the genetic cause. Um, so something like uh, MPNST, it behaves differently. So is the treatment differently? Um, we also wanted to look at um, uh, the different uh, types of treatment. And we did engage with classes that actually been a part of this process from the beginning. And, and he was a great advocate and a voice for, for you. And we, he was very kind in got more of the patient representatives, some of who were on this call to, to join and take part in our work. But um, uh, class was very clear at the beginning that the psychosocial needs of people with NF1 would benefit, um, what, 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 what type of support would be useful for them, um, specifically around the, the, uh, the risk of tumours and being diagnosed with a tumour. And that um, wasn't in the original scope, but uh, after advocacy from class, we included it. Um, so... In, when I mentioned about what type of tumours um, we could be looking at, and actually there's about 13 different types of tumours, I think, off the top of my head. You can see here atypical neurofibromas, uh, uh, optic pathway gliomas, non-optic pathway gliomas in adults and in children, uh, other, other types of tumours like brain, a CNS, uh, GIST, breast cancer, JML, JMML, atypical, uh, orbital and periorbital, uh, and I can never say this one correctly, class, so help me out, the uh, cytoma one, um, <laughs> um, theochromocytoma, I think it is, um, and of course, MPNST, and we had also uh, identified about the uh, atypical neurofibromas, um, and in the beginning, they, we were treating them separately to MPNST, but be, as we went through the, the, this year, we realized that in suspecting, uh, before some, an MPNST is confirmed, actually the tumor could be an atypical one as well. So the workup was, very, was similar. So we, we put them together to ensure that we could figure out whether it was MPNST or an atypical. So, so those are the tumor types, oh, and cutaneous. Um, we set up, uh, because we had agreed the scope of the guideline um, being tumors, uh, tu uh, around tumor management, um, we 
we and we included those clinical questions around uh, psychosocial support. We were then able to decide on which type of experts we needed uh, in the core writing group, which was classes in the core writing group. Um, we have 12 clinicians involved there, all at different types of specialty, which reflect the scope of the guideline, um, covering seven member states. We also had an extended team uh, of experts, which were, we call them the guideline group or the re review group. We had 21 experts in that, um, and they, were, they covered nine member states. So that's in addition to the core writing group members. And class was uh, really helpful because you're a well-connected community, well-organized community. So we, uh, we've got seven, and I think uh, uh, some of the people are on the call today, Ren, uh, Ren uh, uh, class of people on the call today. I'm looking at you. Yeah, I think they're on the call today. Um, so we had seven uh, patient representatives and we chose pay, uh, people from different countries to ensure that we had um, we were able to have that range of experiences, not just uh, seven people from Germany. Um, and uh, at the, as we, we've been working with these three groups this year, we've been very active, um, and I'll talk through the process in a second. Um, the, we're, we have now got a draft <laughs> guideline, draft set of recommendations and um, we will be doing a Delphi exercise. Um, a Delphi is a methodology for uh, forming consensus. Now, whilst there is some good evidence out there, um, there is gaps in evidence. And so then it's down to clinical experience uh, and opinion um, based on uh, how uh, the, 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 the teams in the different hospitals. So we needed the, the Delphi approach will be used to uh, test whether the um, gui the guideline recommendations we have um, uh, to get consensus that we, if we're picking an age range, let's say 14 to start surveillance, in another country they might say 17, another country they might say 12, so to form that consensus. So we have uh, over 120 experts, including the patient representatives, um, and the people from the guideline group and the core writing group, we've got 120 experts from 19 member states involved in the Delphi project, which we're about to start, which I think is a really healthy number. Um, so if you wanted just to look in a bit more detail of who we had now, I explained the scope of the guideline. So the core writing group, we had, we've got a pediatrician who, uh, uh, Rihanna, who will be joining us in a minute. Uh, she's the chair uh, from, um, uh, Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam. We have a co two or three clinical geneticists. We have a dermatologist, a neurologist, a neuro-oncologist, a radiologist, a ma ma max factor surgeon, patient representatives, and I'm sure there's another one in there. Um, uh, so we had quite a good coverage. Um, uh, we have in our extended group, we had a uh, neuropsychologist. Um, we have about four or five involved. Uh, adult oncologist, uh, sarcoma surgeons, op ophthalmologists, etc. cetera. Um, and in the Delphi approach, we've got roughly the same, but it slightly is a bit broader still. We've got gynecolog gynecologists, uh, um, psychiatrists as well, uh, clinical nurse specialists, uh, um, the one thing I want to just highlight is the guideline is uh, being developed uh, under with EU funding. So the guideline is for the European Union to use. Um, so the development of this is very much with experts from the EU. We have a very rich uh, body of experts, with quite a lot of experience. Um, quite a few of them are international leads as well. Um, what we are planning to do is to um, we have involved, I think, two experts from the US, um, someone who's an ophthalmologist and someone who I think is an oncologist class, if I, if I remember that right. Um, and they're more special advisors because they are really leading that field at the moment. And we wanted to make sure that we kept abreast with the latest developments. Um, the process which we've done, we wanted, uh, we started in spring where we started doing the preparation work where we 
brought the team together, the core writing group. We defined the, the topic area. Um, in the summer, we uh, clarified the, 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 the topic area. We, we detailed that into a more detailed scope. Um, we had we formed the, had the patient representatives come and we had meetings with them to check with the scope of the guideline is what, what, what we should be covering in terms of clinical questions. And um, there was consensus that that was uh, of value, uh, targeting tumor management. However, there was a strong call for other types of guidelines which are needed around uh, ophthalmology, not ophthalmology, um, orthopedic issues and uh, psychosocial support um, uh, for, for people with NF1. So, and also more, not, not the severe type, but guidelines for uh, less severe NF1 as well, because there was a call for that. So we've included those on the list of guidelines which we want to develop in the future. Um, so whilst we, we have to focus on one, one topic now, um, we have listened. We did a literature review uh, uh, based on uh, the uh, questions and the scope of the guideline. We graded the evidence. In the autumn, we wrote the GAT recommendations. We completed the first draft of the guideline. And now as we move in towards Christmas, we're, we're starting the Delphi process to uh, ensure that there is a consensus. Um, and we, we will be having all the recommendations uh, checked uh, with through going through this process, not just the ones which um, are based on opinion and experience. And hopefully next spring we'll have this approved. Um, what I wanted to add right at the beginning was um, this international work, and I can never remember the group class who, who's leading it, but I know that the, all the clinicians we know and work with are collaborating. But there, there's a new guideline being developed for diagnostic, uh, um, the diagnosis of NF1, NF2 and schwannomatosis. And um, we're waiting for that to be published. So instead of repeating that work, we, the, the network, EON Gentoris, will uh, review that guideline and endorse it and adopt it. Um, which hopefully will then make the implementation more easy in Europe. Um, and conversely, when we finish our guideline on tumour management, we would like that international group to review and endorse the, the, um, the tumour management guideline. Um, I was really surprised, I thought, with this guideline, because there is lots of evidence out there for NF1. I thought this guideline, this type of guideline, would be there. And I was surprised that this type of information wasn't in one place. So I think this guideline will have a big impact because it's in one place, all that information together. Um, we have already started uh, developing a guideline for schwannomatosis. Um, we're about the same point in the process for that. Normally guidelines for schwannomatosis have been included in the guideline for NF2. So the ACCR one, um, which I think was led by Manchester. Um, um, but we, we, we decided that it is a different condition and we wanted to uh, give it, it focus on it uh, by itself. So we've had a group following the same type of process, uh, same type of structure with experts um, for, who, are, who are experts in schwannomatosis. And we, we're, we're at the same point in having a first draft of the guideline and we'll be doing a Delphi process as well. Um, we are planning to do next year an NF2 guideline. Um, now the ACCR guideline 2018 had a revision in 2019, um, but it is actually focused more on children than adults. So what we want to do next year is to, in 2021 is to uh, update the NF2 guideline for, for children, but also develop one for adults. Uh, that's outstanding. Um, and, uh, and as I mentioned earlier, the patient representatives who are here had said about the orthopedic issues and neurocognitive issues. So we want to also prioritize doing a guideline for that. I think that's it. I hope that was helpful. <laughs>